because of his appearance. He was abandoned by his parents. Years later, he pays them an unannounced visit. Much to their astonishment. The claim that a child's birth is one of life's most remarkable moments is made frequently. It's believed that the first moment you hold a small creature when they arrive, an unmatched love is created. But not everyone feels this way. As demonstrated by the case of a newborn whose parents abandoned him due to the way he looked. Yasmin Mills was a popular and attractive girl who had a wonderful life. Because of her sense of humor, intelligence, and stylish clothes, she was very attractive. And she used that to her advantage to get what she wanted. Because to her privileged upbringing, Yasmin's life was relatively easy throughout high school. Despite the envy of other girls and the attention of boys. When she was 18, in her last year of high school, she met Owen, a new student who was tall, black, and attractive. Owen fell in love with Yasmin despite all the girls clamoring for his attention. And luckily, she felt the same way. As the most popular couple in school, Yasmin's pregnancy caused an unexpected change in their life. The 18-year-old was taken aback when he learned of the pregnancy. And Yasmin and Owen struggled with the situation. Because they thought they were too young to have children. They thought about alternative choices, but ultimately chose to retain the baby. Yasmin had a difficult pregnancy. Her body changed significantly. And she battled to regain her ideal figure while dealing with excess weight. Bloating. And skin problems. But what bothered her the most was the sickness, which persisted all the while and made an already terrible situation even more difficult. When the couple was making decisions about their lives, they thought that having a baby would be beneficial because of its obvious cuteness. Owen and Yasmin were both sure that their baby would inherit their gorgeous looks, making them an incredibly stunning family. Yasmin had a difficult nine months before going into labor and giving birth, which took more than five hours. After all of this, Yasmin and Owen waited impatiently to see their son again in the maternity ward before the staff took the baby away to be cleaned. But the pair was negatively astonished when they saw their child. For the first time, Yasmin couldn't believe what she saw when the nurse gave her the little bundle saying this can't be my baby owen was astounded just like yasmin they had expected the baby to be lovely and cherub like but instead it was plump with a pig's nose and a face that was pressed in on itself the most startling thing of all was that their infant had werewolf like thick black hair covering his entire body fearing disapproval from the public Yasmin and Owen were disgusted by the way their kid looked and thought they couldn't keep him. The couple signed the papers to place the child for adoption right away, giving him the name Peter. Peter was formally placed for adoption after a few weeks. Yasmin and Owen wanted to move on and create the ideal lifestyle. They thought two stunning individuals like them should have, since no one wanted to take care of the abnormally hairy infant. Peter had to go through a number of foster homes along his voyage. He did, however, ultimately find a home with Heather Finch and her husband Gabriel, an older couple who already had two children of their own and were devoted to raising them. Unfortunately, Heather experienced difficulties giving birth to her second child, which prevented her from becoming pregnant again. As a result, she decided to foster less fortunate children while she and Gabriel waited to be adopted. Heather and Gabriel were taken aback when they first saw Peter. But when they watched him, the baby glanced up and grinned broadly. The couple instantly sought to adopt Peter after realizing they needed to do more for him than just foster him. They were drawn to the happy disposition of the boy and wanted 
to provide him with the family and loving environment he deserved. After some time, Peter's adoption was finalized, and he was welcomed into their family. With the exception of his unusually thick hair, which he inherited from birth, Peter had a very typical upbringing. His brothers Michael and Tom put an end to any bullying even. Though they had to put up with him being teased by other kids. Heather and Gabriel waited until Peter reached 18 before. They decided to tell Peter the truth about his birth. They told him he was adopted. But they still loved him and wished he were their real son. Peter was surprised. But he still loved them very much. But out of curiosity about his real parents. He used the adoption agency to find Yasmin and Owen. Who he was shocked to learn lived close by. Peter found out about Yasmin and Owen after doing some. Research and getting in touch with the adoption agency. He drove for almost an hour to visit them. Driven by a need to know why they had given him up. When the door of the ancient house opened when he pulled up in front of it. Yasmin was startled to see her son standing directly in front of her. But Yasmin had not had a good run of years. She had attended college but struggled academically after giving up on Peter. Yasmin eventually failed out of school because she had been preoccupied with partying rather than her education. Her father had stopped providing her with financial support. Because he was upset with her actions, Yasmin was forced to work in a nearby shop as a result. Her once youthful face and well-groomed body became marred by stress wrinkles and tired eyes as a result of the long hours and demanding nature of her profession. She carried extra weight. So her body took the brunt of the blow and she bent over a little. Yasmin had obviously suffered for a physical appearance for someone who had stressed the significance of appearance. Peter asked his biological mother outright why she had abandoned him while she was standing in front of him. Yasmin then said that she couldn't handle the idea of parenting a child with such an odd appearance. She thought she was the most attractive girl in school and Owen, the most attractive boy. Therefore she was afraid that people would judge him for having too much hair. Yasmin was followed by a heavier Owen, whose hair had begun to recede. Peter noticed the irony of the couple's decisions as he watched them. They believed that by letting go of him, their attractiveness would allow them to enjoy opulent lives. Rather, they were left with menial occupations and deteriorating health. Unexpectedly, Peter expressed gratitude to Yasmin and Owen for their choice to place him for adoption. He conveyed his appreciation for having a loving family and understanding brothers as a child, as well as for teaching him the value of character above looks. Peter realized that if he had stayed with his birth parents, he probably would not have learned these things. Once he'd expressed his thanks, he turned around and headed back home, knowing that his family would always love him, no matter how he looked. The story is really amazing. And everyone's response in Peter's shoes can be different. While some may experience bitterness or rage, others, like Peter, may come to terms with their difficult upbringing and feel appreciative of their life's successes. This is the end of the first story. Now let's move on the second story. When Cassiopeia was about to give birth, she was surprised to find herself unexpectedly imprisoned in a cave, walking with her mother-in-law, Carmela, on a little wooded path close to their home. Nine months pregnant, Cassiopeia reveled in the happy expectation of giving birth to Chepito, her first child and Carmela's first grandson. Despite Carmela's advice to head back early because night was falling, Cassiopeia was intrigued by what appeared to be a large cave opening and declared that she would love to explore. Famous for her athletic skill and love of nature's trials, Cassiopeia stowed her lighter and stubbed out her cigarette. Unwavering in her resolve, Carmela saw that Cassiopeia struggled with her want to smoke.
But she also recognized her adventurous nature. So she knew there was no point in trying to talk her out of it. The two entered the cave and were astounded by the luxuriant formations and bizarre stalactites. But curious as she was, Cassiopeia inadvertently cut herself off from Carmela. Her sense of being lost and alone set in as she cried out for her friend in vain, causing her to become uneasy. Cassiopeia considered the risks of being lost in the large cave. From collapses and falls from elevated sections to confusion. The once interesting cave was now turning into a terrifying maze. Recognizing the standard operating procedure for handling situations like these. Cassiopeia mentally prepared herself. Aware of the dangers of hypothermia and dehydration in the cold. Unfit environment for a pregnant woman. By using her past experiences as a guide. She was able to resist giving in to panic. A vital attitude in dangerous circumstances. Following a set of instructions for exploring forgotten caves. She started by inhaling deeply and examining her surroundings. In the low light of the day without any equipment like helmets or torches. She continued. Following her instincts alone. Unsure of what would happen but determined to live. Eventually. The strain on her large pregnant abdomen forced her to take a break. The baby growing inside her moved excitedly. Causing her to stop for a little while. Memories came flooding back. Of her parents signing her up for a high school survival course. Reconstructing one's path while lost is crucial. As stressed by the instructor. Who is an experienced survival specialist. She shared insightful observations with the class and emphasized that thinking back on the actions made could help one restore orientation. Cassiopeia, who was renowned for being easily distracted, was told to never give up. The teacher said that staying where one is disoriented can help. Rescue efforts happen more quickly. Periodically turning off lights helps preserve battery life and ensures that there will be illumination when needed. Cassiopeia felt the hours passing. The cave growing darker when she opened her eyes. She remembered the instructor's advice and realized she should wait for help to arrive. But reality wasn't what she had anticipated. Days went by as Cassiopeia was confused, desperate, and tired. Yet the tiredness subsided when she thought of her growing pregnant child. As she lay there, a stinging sensation on her foot caused the skin to turn black, almost purple, obscured by her growing tummy. It was difficult to examine the wound. She walked away, trying not to draw too much attention, but her foot twitched like a nervous tick. She stumbled and clutched her stomach as she looked around, for a quiet place to rest. In the distance. She noticed what seemed like a natural well among stalactites. She was forced to walk towards it by thirst and a pounding headache. But she wasn't sure if it was the right choice. Cassiopeia felt relieved as she got closer to the well and saw it wasn't a trap. She was able to wash her body and soak her feet in the clear, clean water. Moving on. She came across what appeared to be a decent place to sleep. But as she lay there examining the cave, her desperate state grew more acute. And a sharp itching sensation spread throughout her body. She felt her way down her arm and felt lumps that indicated an eruption that she didn't know was coming. The cave rose up and twisted, making me quite lightheaded. Every step turned into an ordeal, reminding her of a pain she'd had early in her pregnancy. She became concerned for her unborn child's health when she realized that the well might have contaminated the water. Fearing that she would be cursed, she collapsed against a rock, giving in to Edoima and a heavy feeling in her hands, legs, and eyes. She closed her eyes and fell asleep, dreaming of getting out of the cave. When she woke up, she was much better. Albeit still a little sore and swollen. 
she became aware of the need to exercise caution and learnt to move quickly. Inspect surfaces before sitting or lying down. And, most importantly, look closely at water before drinking it. Her prenatal aches seemed to be temporarily forgotten as she battled to survive in the pitch-black cavern. But desperation soon took hold of her. Her name, which reflects the power her mother instilled in her, served as a compass. Cassiopeia realized that her name represented courage and strength, both earthly and spiritual. Accepting this inner power, she made the decision to persevere. Realizing that it was one of her most important qualities, Cassiopeia overcome her initial anxiety and cautious pace by striving to become stronger. She saw the cave as her new home and that she would soon have to give birth. When her mother-in-law failed to find a suitable site for her much-anticipated son to be born, Cassiopeia took it upon herself to do the quest. As she explored the cave, she saw that it was an extended formation with several entrances coming together to form a single point. She decided to avoid it because of the darkness and coolness. That seemed to indicate there might be danger. She noticed stones that looked like crystals and gave out a soft glow at night. Almost like fluorescence. She removed the stones with a pointed rock so they could be used as temporary lanterns for when total darkness descended. She had to learn to hunt in order to survive. And she was able to hit bats hanging from the cave ceiling with precise stone throws. She was disgusted by the thought of eating these animals. But she knew it was necessary. She created a fire with her pocket lighter and some dry roots. To roast the tiny yet nutrient-dense bats. But now she had a fresh worry when the lighter stopped igniting and its alcohol supply ran out. She spent hours exploring before finding a depression in the cave that was somewhat more comfortable and less chilly. A decent place to give birth. She assembled crystals for light, sharp stones for scissors, and made comfy blankets for the upcoming birth. Much like she would have built a makeshift house. She was immensely relieved to know that she could make fire by striking the crystals together and was pleased with her survival instincts. She had been out of the well for days now, and the threats she had been receiving had decreased. She was sorely tempted to drink her own urine at times of intense thirst. She experienced nausea and vomiting over the first several days, but she eventually adjusted and got better by using her fortitude and survival instincts. Time weighed hard on Cassiopeia. In spite of her bravery, every minute, awake or asleep, was a constant reminder that she needed to exercise caution. Because there was a chance of hypothermia, which was more dangerous because she was pregnant. Due to the cave's inherent low temperatures, the nighttime cold became a serious problem. As indicated by the odd sounds made by animals that were not visible. She made do with plastic bags she discovered in the cave. To keep warm while she shivered from the cold. Cassiopeia thought of running away a lot. But she ended up getting lost more often than she thought. After coming up with a strategy. She went back to exploring two days later. Marking her route with little stone heaps. Bits of paper. And objects from the ground to help with orientation. The channels of the cave were narrow, and she wound her way through them, sometimes going back to make sure she didn't miss anything or any signs of life. Cassiopeia, surviving on everything she could find, including moss, leaves, and tiny insects, came across an interesting fungus, equipped with knowledge of its edible components. She was ecstatic to learn of its anti-inflammatory, antibacterial, and restorative qualities. She continued in spite of the nagging pain in her back, packing more of these mushrooms than usual in her jacket. She would huddle up next to wet rocks at night, close her eyes, and hope for some miracle of escape or help. 
Cassiopeia woke up in the mornings more self-assured. Having learned so much. She gained the ability to read air currents as possible cave entrances. But her excitement was dashed when she saw snakes in places. With good air flow, she hesitated. Remembering the stories her grandmother had told her about. Snakes and pregnant women. One of the stories described a snake trying to milk from a woman's baby by putting its tail in its mouth to calm it quietly. Even though Cassiopeia wasn't sure whether the story was true. She knew that caution was necessary because she knew which snake. Species were poisonous. Such as the velvet and noyaka. Their bites resulted in blisters. Numbness. Inflammation. Suppuration. And a high temperature. She also came upon a cottonmouth which is infamous for its poisonous bite that can lead to pain, swelling, and redness. She saw animals and insects and learned about their habits. She saw when scorpions passed through the cave in the heat and learned how to protect herself from their stings. She was intrigued by a strange sound she heard at night and found out it was a horned owl. The owl appeared menacing at first because of its enormous size and big gazing eyes. Yet it did not move. Cassiopeia observed its tranquil survival routine and was motivated to emulate it. Observing the owl became into a nocturnal custom, cultivating a renewed reverence for the stunning animal. The owl, on the other hand, never invaded Cassiopeia's space as if it expected the same courtesy from her. Cassiopeia was fascinated by the owl's eyes because of their capacity to change color in the dark and turn their head in an interesting way. The owl eventually vanished, and Cassiopeia began to question whether it had been an apparition at all. When the time came to push, Cassiopeia tried a few various positions. Thinking back to the doctor's previous advice, she pushed while kneeling then changed to sitting, and even curled up on her hands and knees for comfort. She took a calm moment to check that the baby's head was indeed there. And as soon as it did, the rest of its body moved quickly after. The noise appeared to even rouse the birds in the cave. As Cassiopeia let out yells of delight and pain, she put her newborn in her arms and waited to cut the cord. Instead choosing to do it with a sharp stone, she took a seat and lit a fire. A rite that had been planned to increase the baby's iron stores. Reduce the chance of anemia. And promote healthy growth. Her comprehensive research on the subject during her. Incarceration served as the basis for her preparation. Glad that she had given birth to her baby Chepito by herself. In the shadows. In the vast vault. Cassiopeia devoted her life to caring for and nursing her child. Three months earlier. She had never breastfed before. But she had learned how with hands-on sessions with other pregnant women. Including her husband Enrique. Practicing on a doll fashioned like a newborn. Cassiopeia positioned herself and Chepito appropriately. Assisting him in successfully latching onto her breast. She understood that a proper latch is essential to a successful nursing session. Recognizing that breast support was necessary during the first few days. She overcame the difficulties. Knowing that. Like other babies. Chepito would soon develop a regular pattern of sucking. Which would facilitate effective nursing. Cassiopeia was overjoyed when Chepito was able to successfully nurse her even though it wasn't without some discomfort. When she went outside to look for food a few hours later, she was ecstatic to find an underground river running through the cave, giving her plenty of drinkable water. But getting to the river meant wading deep, which soaked her clothes and made her have to part from Chepito. In tears while she gathered water for the night. On one such occasion, she stepped into the water and felt something tugging her and she became terrified in the dark. She called for assistance, momentarily losing her mind, 
and immersed herself to look into it. Like the cave. The water possessed a fear beyond her comprehension. Sensing a current. She saw a big shadow dragging her. But with her newfound power. She managed to get away while holding onto a stone. Wet and without a bucket that the river had carried away with it. She did the best she could to dry off and spent the next few. Chilly hours cuddling with her child. When Cassiopeia woke up the following day to her calls for food. The situation wasn't as nice. Snakes were drawn to his cries. Or maybe it was just her imagination playing tricks on her. Over the next few days. She experienced a painful tightness in her chest that got worse every hour. She was so desperate that she forgot the doctor's instructions regarding mastitis. The doctor had informed the sympathetic couple some time ago. About the signs of mastitis. Which included burning. Inflammation. Discomfort. And maybe fever, symptoms that were just like the flu or general anxiety. Exactly like her current state of affairs. The physician stressed the value of continuing breastfeeding when. A patient has mastitis because it helps to empty the breasts and stops the infection from spreading. The opposite happened, in spite of worries about the flavor of the breast. Milk, which might occasionally be salty and cause the baby to reject it. Happily, the baby kept nursing, aiding in the mother's healing. The physician advised offering the other breast and mentioned how uncomfortable it is to breastfeed from the diseased breast. By opening the bra on both sides, Cassiopeia could more easily transfer milk from her hurting breast onto a piece of fabric, in this case, a piece of plastic. The hardest part for her was leaving her infant asleep close. By while she went to collect healing mushrooms, Cassiopeia picked out the less appetizing mushrooms that were Good for her healing after learning to recognize them by their vivid colors. Even though she had to overcome obstacles, like a bat incident. That resulted in a leg injury while hunting. Cassiopeia used moss to stop the bleeding. Eating mushrooms eased her agony. And eventually she was able to take back control of. Her body and get rid of the suffering. Her attempts to call for assistance anticipating rescuer's arrival, highlighted the days she spent in the cave. But as the days stretched into weeks, help did not arrive, leaving Cassiopeia confused and yearning for any outside voice or sound even though she had become accustomed to the cave's constraints. Fear remained even in the early mornings, keeping them from sleeping well while they looked after their child, who slept on a bed made of leaves that the loving mother had fashioned to keep him warm on days when things weren't going well. Carrying the baby in her arms. She went hunting. Searched for plants that could heal. And went to the river in the afternoons before sundown to get water. Sometimes she was so desperate that she cried uncontrollably. She was tired and could not seem to find the way out of the cave. She struggled to accept that her little boy would have to face survival issues at such a young age. But her resources were limited. She could only bear it day by day, getting up, going hunting, getting water, and savoring the time she spent with Chepito, who fascinated his mother more than anyone else. Chepito was a beacon of hope and warmth, especially when his mother stroked and touched him, gently while she was nursing. For Cassiopeia, time appeared to go on forever. And the lines separating sanity became more hazy than the local river. Every now and then, feelings of loneliness overcame her and she started talking to herself. Days without talking made her discomfort worse. Making her throat dry and hurting when she yawned. Stress did not make her feel any better. Not even with the help of mushrooms. The loneliness was the worst thing that could have happened to Cassiopeia. It made her think and feel like a captive who has spent a long time alone. She wondered how she would teach her son survival skills. And wondered whether she would live her whole life in that remote location. 
Occasionally, she felt hopelessness seeping in, luring her to give in to the icy embrace of the river. But she was driven by the same spirit that had kept her, going throughout the first few days of her captivity. First-time mothers face a range of circumstances and emotions. From the exhilaration of first contact to the typical sensations of love at first sight, Chepito's presence acted as a continual reminder of these experiences. One particular difficulty Cassiopeia faced was learning how to make diapers for her son. She used plastic wrap at first, but realized it was damaging his sensitive skin. She looked for another way to console him. Determined to do so. Another challenge was bathing him in the river. She had to time it so that the water would reach a mild temperature. In the first few washes. Before progressively growing more accustomed to it. The little child used to wail uncontrollably when in direct touch with the water. When nursing failed to make Chepito feel better. Cassiopeia ventured further into the cave to gather medicinal mushrooms to ease his suffering. But she also understood that every scenario involving her child had its own set of unique obstacles and problems, causing her to experience agony, guilt, and terror that persisted all night. Despite her lack of experience with prayer, Cassiopeia discovered that she was in need of comfort and hope. So, before going to bed, she looked at her child and prayed to God for help. She was emotionally exhausted from the hard experience of being in a cave with a newborn. Unlike the others, she dreamed of something specific one morning. Years ago, her instructor talked to her about being lost and stuck and gave her advice on how to get out. An easy approach to determine how close an exit is is to look for an increase in bugs, bats, or birds, according to the teacher. Even if it was unclear how far it was, it was still a good indication. So they shouldn't leave that location. When Cassiopeia heard her son cry, her eyes opened, and she gave him a breastfeed while she made her way through the cave. Abruptly, a beam of light shot through a fissure in the rocks overhead giving Cassiopeia a boost in strength. She was weak and confused, but she crawled determinedly, holding Chepito in her arms. She left the cave through a tiny entrance at the top. The sun setting with the birds chirping in jubilation, painted the sky an orange hue that was simply magnificent. She found it difficult to accept that she had actually made it out of the cave. She stepped outdoors now, staring at the skies not sure if it was dawn or dusk she was startled by every sound and although she was relieved to be out of there she was also more confused and anxious since she realized she had escaped alone without anyone looking for her it seemed unbelievable to cassiopeia that she had been lost for almost a month she emerged from the cave through a little fissure close to its entrance and found what seemed like a map. After a closer look, the cave's location was indicated by a circle and a X, and there was a handwritten inscription identifying it as La Caverna. She had heard rumors about this cave from years ago, rumors that people never came back from. It was accompanied by a number of tales that suggested the existence of ethereal animals that connected other planets and evil spirits that were out to get lost souls. There were even stories about babies that got lost there and were never seen again. Cassiopeia was therefore both surprised and grateful that she had managed to flee without coming into contact with any evil beings. Only kind-hearted ones. She was astounded. But she was also afraid as she surveyed her surroundings and considered going back home. Her immediate plans were to introduce her son to the family and take a bath. Though Cassiopeia was unsure of how long she had been in the cave, she was confident that she had entered with her mother-in-law, which made her question why her mother-in-law had not gone looking for her. 
she was even more shocked when she saw that the handwriting on the map was Carmela's. She began to suspect that her mother-in-law might not have been entirely sincere in her declaration of passing away. Considering the past setbacks and lack of interest from her mother-in-law, this insight was not wholly surprising. She thought back to the day she was stuck in the cave and laughed at the irony that her mother-in-law had supported her, let her take the lead, and had even started the expedition, even though she had been the one who had originally intended to investigate the cave. With Chepito in her arms, Cassiopeia grabbed an oxcart driven by two horses from a passing traveler. When she got to her cabin, she was shocked to see a somber ritual taking place outside her window. She was shocked to see a giant photo of herself next to a makeshift coffin, where a candle flickered. Her family had even had a symbolic wake because they thought she lost her life. She was deeply disappointed in herself to realize that she had been mourned without anyone looking for her. Cassiopeia was amazed that her mother-in-law had never revealed that she had been held captive in the cave. Even though she assumed they thought she lost her life, her inner agony grew as she peered out at the upsetting scene. The fact that she was here and living was the most painful thing. Thoughts raced through her head. From ridiculous questions to more sensible ones. As she debated whether or not to go in. She could see her mother-in-law sobbing and her husband sobbing. Through the window. As if she was actually lamenting her actual disappearance. However. Cassiopeia knew full well that her mother-in-law's ultimate goal was to keep her husband away from her, when she finally did decide to go inside. The people around her reacted as though they were seeing a ghost or specter. A sense of disbelief permeated the audience, causing some people to puke and others to flee in terror. Her spouse changed from being in mourning to a scared smile. As people claimed her body, he was still in shock. Her mother-in-law, however, was the one with the most shocked and impressed expression when she realized Cassiopeia had made it out of the cave. She had misjudged her. In the days that followed, Carmela advised her son to start over with a new wife and proposed that they proclaim Cassiopeia passing away, claiming her body was missing. Carmela even gave the address of a well-known family, hoping that a rich relationship would help her achieve her objectives. The family looked surprised. Later on, Cassiopeia found out that Carmela was the one who planned the entire scheme. Carmela had always wanted Cassiopeia to lost life since she never saw her as her daughter-in-law and thought Cassiopeia was too poor for her son because she was a modest young woman. Cassiopeia was a server. And Enrique, along with his mother, waited for her service. It was not a fairy tale when they first met. From the moment they spoke, Cassiopeia and Enrique felt a chemistry between them that was unlike anything they had ever experienced. Problems started to arise for both of them two months later. Cassiopeia had to make a choice because she didn't have the titles companies, or money to attend the famous gatherings that Enrique's mother arranged. Carmela would not stop telling Enrique that Cassiopeia was not the right woman for him, that she could neither advance him nor carry on the family name. Enrique, who was incredibly in love, persisted on marrying Cassiopeia in spite of Carmela's opposition, because he wanted a lifetime marriage and envisioned her as the mother of his children. Aware of her limited power, Carmela started to change the way she felt about her daughter-in-law and made a deliberate plan to put her in a position where she would disappear. As the two women's arguments grew more intense, Cassiopeia's husband intervened to keep them apart. Astonished, Cassiopeia charged Carmela with her passing away, highlighting the seriousness of the act and demanding responsibility. Witnesses inspected Cassiopeia's unkempt appearance and attire. 
and Carmela angrily denied the claim, refusing to acknowledge that she had mispronounced her daughter-in-law passing away. Carmela persisted in denying the accusations despite the fact that she would now face jail time due to her little pregnancy. Cassiopeia, who was on the verge of losing her mind, was about to let out all of her pent-up rage. She described the terrifying events that had occurred in the cave, including hunger, severe thirst, the cold, and giving birth to her kid alone in the shadows. Astonished even further, the onlookers rallied behind Cassiopeia. A mixture of pride and sadness overcame her as she realized how much courage this experience had given her. My son, don't trust that woman. Are you going to wed her or not? Carmela held her son firmly by the shoulders and shook him, hoping he would gaze into her eyes and fall prey to her manipulation. Nevertheless, Enrique knew full well that his mother was a liar and that her sole goal was to declare the woman he loved and their child passed away. Since his mother saw that he was grieving for his wife and child, and instead of telling him the truth, she abandoned him. Enrique felt that her acts were unredeemable. In addition, he continued to be in shock, having trouble breathing normally and experiencing some vertigo. He had been grieving the passing away of his wife only minutes before. And now he was being told that she was expecting a young child. Though it was difficult for him to process this abrupt turn of events. He did not think twice to ignore his mother and run to his love. For a consoling hug. Cassiopeia. On her part. Yearned for those arms and was now completely safe with the guy. She believed she would never see again. It had the atmosphere of a movie scene. Later, Cassiopeia learned that Carmela had lied to the police about her daughter-in-law's whereabouts, reporting her missing in the wilderness while hiding the fact that she was in a cave and harboring passing away wishes. She was pronounced deceased by the authorities after almost a month. Carmela tried to refute her guilt, but her schemes failed. She was taken into custody by law officials when they showed up at her estate a few days later. In the meantime, Cassiopeia became a source of inspiration for the entire community, as well as for several women who found it difficult to show their bravery. Her incredible tale attracted interest from a number of media sources. Cassiopeia, Chepito, and Enrique eventually became a happy family. Enrique, Carmela's son, realized that his mother needed to be held responsible for the act that almost cost the lives of his wife and son, who were the two most important people in his life. Even if it greatly frustrated him, Carmela risked a lengthy jail sentence.